And thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. I'm Jessica Annis, Director of Finance of Hardin County Schools, and this is Brian Woosley from Styles Carter & Associates. Brian um, goes in, he does the audits for Hardin <coughs> County Schools, so he will be auditing all of your paperwork. Um, so he, we're just going to start kind of getting, well, we know you all are busy and probably want to get out of here as much as we do. So um, we are going to get go ahead and get started, and then um, Ron's going to go through the PowerPoint, and then I'll go through um, a couple other things in the folder. So. All right. Well, thanks for being here. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just kind of go through, if you were, because I don't know where you're at as far as if you're new, if you're starting out, if you took over somebody else who didn't leave you anything to follow. Uh, those kind of things happen a lot. So what I thought I would do is what we, we normally do is just sort of go through the process. You know, if I, were, if I were starting from scratch, how do we get there? You know, what steps do we go through to get there? So that's what we're going to talk about first. Um, the first thing that you would do is, and if you're already established, you should have done these things uh, or someone else should have done those to, to get your group going. Um, you obtain articles of organization. Uh, that's what it's called when you're a nonprofit. Uh, you file those with the Kentucky Secretary of State. Uh, those papers must include the exempt purpose and the pro and a dissolution clause. In effect, uh, you know when your entity uh, ceases to exist, uh, what will happen at that point in time? You would need to draft any other documents such as your bylaws, uh, conflict of interest policy. And then uh, after you do that and you're registered with the Secretary of State, then you can obtain your federal identification number, uh, which is through completing the IRS SS4 form, which you can do that. Uh, most people just do it online anymore because you can get that uh, letter from the IRS in a PDF form right away. So those are the first, first things that you would do. The next thing that you would do is either file form 1023 which is the recognition of exempt status uh, under that section of the code. Or there's also a Form 1023-EZ, which is a streamlined application under the 501c3. 501c3 section of the Internal Revenue Code is basically just the section that governs public charities. So that's, uh, that's a section that you would fall under. All right, so you don't have to file for an organization that has less than $5,000 or is expected to have less than $5,000 worth of gross receipts. Um, you may want to file that, and we'll talk about that in a second, uh, if you do. The user fee is $400 if you're, and this is for the 1023, um, if your annual gross receipts are expected to average not more than, what is that, 10,000? And then if you are gonna average more than that, then it goes up to $850. Um, there's also, if you qualify to file the EZ form, then uh, it's only $275, so it's a lot, uh, lot less expensive. And also, the 1023 form itself is a pretty complicated form to fill out. So uh, if you can qualify for the EZ form, you definitely want to go through it. Before you uh, decide which one of those forms to fill out, uh, there's an eligibility worksheet that you go through to determine whether or not you qualify to file the form. Um, if you answer yes to any of those questions on that worksheet, you can't uh, apply under the easy form, so you would need to file the complete form uh, 1023. Uh, if you answer no to those questions, then you may apply using that form. So, uh, so I've got listed in your, in your slides uh, what some of those questions are. Uh, they're pretty straightforward questions, nothing, anything really complicated in there, but uh, as long as you can answer yes to those questions, and if you, if you need any of these forms, uh, you can just go to irs.gov, and uh, you can go to their forms and publication section and get any of these forms that you need. But they have uh, about six questions in here that uh, it will kind of lead you through the process and then as long as you can answer uh, correctly to those questions, then, uh, then you'll qualify and save yourself some time if you have to fill that form out. If you do file that form within uh, 27 months of legal formation, they will make the effective date of your exempt status uh, retroactive back to when your uh, legally formed date was. 
We talked about uh, just a second ago about why you might want to file a form if you're under the 5,000. Uh, if, uh, if somebody wants to donate money to your group, it's not tax deductible uh, to them unless you have uh, an exempt letter where you've been recognized as a, as a public charity by the IRS. So obviously the only way to get that letter is to properly file the paperwork and uh, get that exempt letter. Otherwise, you can't hold yourself out as a tax deductible group. And if, if somebody donates to your group, it is not tax deductible unless you've received that uh, determination letter from the IRS is what they call it. So uh, just for you to be aware of. Uh, also, if somebody does make a donation to you, uh, if any individual donation of cash uh, or check or anything, if it's $250 or more, you need to make sure you send them an acknowledgement in writing for that donation because if it's more than that, if it's that much or more, the IRS will disallow it if they're audited if they do not have written acknowledgement from you. Uh, so you want to make sure you do that. You also want to make sure you include in your letter that uh, no goods or services were received in exchange for that donation. That language has to be on the correspondence from you if they were to get audited. So just a heads up on that uh, in case that uh, in case that happens, uh, we'd hate for somebody to lose their deduction for that. So, All right, so we're up and going. Just like we file our income tax returns every year, uh, nonprofits also have filing requirements uh, for income tax returns. There are basically three levels of those requirements. We'll go from simple to hard. If you're a June 30 year in, uh, the filing requirement is November 15th. Uh, if you're a December year in, then the due date for the filing requirement is May 15th. So those are the dates that these items would be due. Um, if your gross receipts are less than 50000 then all you have to do is go to the IRS website, go through there, uh, and do the 990N, which is an, what they call an electronic postcard. You answer four or five questions, and you're done. And that's all you have to do. If your gross receipts... Uh, are less than 200,000 and your assets are less than 500,000, you can file the 990EZ form. And then if you don't qualify for that, then you file the full uh, 990 form. So also, if you do fundraising within the state, uh, now I will tell you, you know, it won't apply to you because in general, if you do fundraising, you're a nonprofit in the state, you have to file a copy of your tax return with the Secretary of State, but there's an exemption for school-supported organizations. So you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about that one. I will tell you that what the IRS has done is they kind of have a three-year look-back rule. So let's say, for example, you have you filed your paperwork, you're qualified to be a tax-exempt entity. If you do not file either the 990N or the other requested forms, uh, required forms, by the due date or extended due date for three consecutive years, they'll just automatically revoke your exemption and then you'll have to start over. So you have to tr go back and try to get your exemption reinstated. So be very mindful that uh, you have to file these forms uh, every year and be careful when those due dates are. Alternatively, just to give you a heads up, uh, I don't do anything with these, these people, but just as another reference, there is an entity called parentbooster.org uh, where they can get you immediate 501c3 uh, tax status upon when they approve your membership. The last time I checked, the registration fee was $495. They will help you file your uh, documents if you need to. Um, their 990 EZ costs were, were reported between three and 500, and then uh, the full 990 was at least, what is that, 875? Uh, depending on, and that's where they start, but that is an alternative to if you do need to get set up without having to, to go through the other process, but, but either way you still have to be, uh, you have to be legal, you have to be set up through the, as a 501c3, and you have filing requirements from a tax standpoint. So does anybody have any questions about any of that process? Okay. All right. So the second part uh, that we wanted to go through was just what are the guidelines that apply to you 
uh, that come from the Kentucky Department of Education. Their document uh, that they call the Red Book is basically is, it contains all the accounting procedures that apply to, to money that is related to school funds. Uh, it is a state law uh, incorporated through the Kentucky Administrative Regulations and the version that we're working under right now uh, has been around about five years, so since uh, 2013. So basically what they do is they define what a booster type club is. And they say that it's, it's a group that's basically established to support or promote school activities, uh, which obviously we all know that. Uh, they, you may be in supporting a whole student body, a particular group, athletics, whatever it is your, your interest is. So it's also important to point out that you are your own entity. You're an independent entity from the district. So uh, everything that you do uh, falls back on the officers of that group. Normally, uh, what happens is those are created by the parents because the parents are the ones that set set the organization up. They do the paperwork and are responsible for all the filing requirements. Uh, the parents should be planning and conducting those uh, fundraisers. You do have to have, if you're new or you have not done this, uh, the local school board does have to approve uh, your participation, your ability to raise funds in the district itself. So that's something that you need to make sure has been approved. Like if, if it's a booster club that wants to be approved to raise funds within the district, That's what do they go through? That's the question. The principal can disorganize or organize any booster group in their school. So right opposite, if the principal feels like you're not doing the purpose that you, know, that you were supposed to be, you know, raising money for basketball, he can disorganize you at any time as well. So he'll... He'll, you know, establish or she will establish whether or not you can have a booster group in that school. And if you're new, that, then they would need to submit the name of the group yeah. to who at the board would take that to get, it, get the board to approve them. Um, well, the principal would probably send a decision paper. Okay. All right. Uh, you need to have your own bank account uh, where you keep your money. Um, that would be under the federal ID number you obtained uh, when you were organized, so uh, just make sure you're doing that. You're not allowed to use the federal ID number of the school or the school district. And in addition to that, uh, if you're exempt from sales tax, uh, then you would need to, uh, you can get an exemption for that under your own name. You just can't use the school's uh, exempt number. So once you're organized as a nonprofit, uh, and have that determination letter, then you can get uh, your sales tax exemption. All right, the federal ID number and the names of the officers need to be submitted to the principal um, for the school at which you're most closely related at the beginning of the school year or within the first 30 days of the transaction for that year. So. That's the first uh, timeline requirement, some thing, uh, things that you need to submit to the principal. And that would be now. I mean, I'm sure 90% of you all have basketball, football, band, cheerleading, soccer, volleyball, all the sports pretty much start as soon as school starts. So the very first thing, and Brian will go into a little bit more detail, is the list of officers, the e e EIN number, um, and a budget that he'll talk about a little bit later. Those probably need to be going to your school's um, bookkeeper or office manager as we speak. Just a reminder uh, again that you are your own entity. Uh, the district can't be held responsible for something that a booster club does uh, from a legal standpoint. So just important to realize that the officers of that group are the ones uh, who are the responsible parties. As far as uh, some district employee rules, uh, if you're a district employee, which is defined as if you get a W-2 uh, from, from a district, that factors you in as a district employee. Um, they can't be involved uh, in ordering or receiving goods, 
receiving, depositing funds, paying vendors, or otherwise dispersing funds. If you do uh, have any property that is yours that is kept on school property, um, that is supposed to be in a location where nobody else can get to, where no other school personnel would be able to get to, that only the officers or the people authorized by the booster club could get to. So, so if you're a district employee, uh, just remember you can't fill out uh, any order forms, you can't take money to the bank, uh, can't write checks, uh, or anything like that. It can't be anybody who, uh, who works for the district. So just keep that. Yes? No. A district employee, could, the question was could they be on the bank account? A district employee could not be on the bank account, could not have signature authority over the uh, bank account. And that, someone said, what is really an employee? Um, if they receive a W-2 from us, then they are an employee. So even if they're a substitute teacher, substitute bus driver, substitute, you know, all the way down to, you know, and in conjunction with that, um, district employees can serve as a general member or a member of the board. However, uh, if you're a member of the school board, you can only be a general member. You can't be an officer uh, of the group. Uh, in addition, uh, like I just said, um, neither local board members nor district employees can serve as the treasurer uh, or any other officer with check signing authority. So. Uh, just make sure that whoever the people are that are that are fulfilling those roles for you uh, are not employees of, of the school district. Any questions? Any of that? One recommendation is if you were to have to have something shipped to the school, uh, a district employee is not supposed to sign for it. Uh, because that would be receiving the goods. So you would want to have it drop shipped uh, if, you, if you can do that, if that's, you know, if that's your intent to have it shipped to the school. So that nobody would have to sign for it. The school activity funds themselves uh, at the school level uh, can't reimburse you for any of your expenses. So, uh, so if you buy something, they are not allowed to write you a check or give you any money to, to to help pay for anything. It can go the other way, obviously. You can give them money and let the school buy it, but they just can't uh, do the reverse. Also, uh, no booster clubs can pay the fee for any referee or officials uh, of athletic events. They can donate that money to the district and let the district pay it. Um, and they cannot enhance salaries or stipends for any district employees. They can donate to the district, um, as long as the board allows that. One of the things to keep in mind if, you, if you're thinking about doing that is the IRS has rules called private benefit and inurement, which basically means if you're a public charity, uh, you shouldn't, your purpose or you shouldn't use your funds to enhance one person's uh, pay or something like that. Uh, like for example, if you're the, if you're the band boosters, you know, your purpose is to support the students of the band, not to pay for the salary of the band director. So, because that benefits the band director individually. So, the IRS rules kind of prohibit that. So, just keep that, uh, keep that in mind. And we really, I mean, if it's a set position by the board, um, we don't allow any additional stipends or anything. But, for instance, I know band, they bring in color guard coaches, drum line coaches, things like that, just for like marching band season, they're not a position determined by the board. So they're a little different, um, you know, as to what you guys can pay for. But if it's a, if it is a set position and they get their salary, you know, through us already, we don't take any money from boosters to increase that. It, we just don't work that way. Also, uh, if you buy something Let's say you're, uh, let's you're football boosters and you buy uniforms for the football team um, and you donate those to the school and the school accepts those, then from that point on it's the school's responsibility to pay for the upkeep of those 
they can ask you to donate money to them, but they can't require you to do them upkeep. So just like with uh, band instruments or anything like that, once they accept it, it's theirs, uh, and they would have to keep it up just like they bought it. So, so keep that in mind. I hear a lot of times where, uh, where the booster clubs think they have to keep maintaining that stuff after they donate it in, but once the school accepts it, it's theirs to, it's theirs to keep. The board can approve some additional regulations. You don't usually see that a lot. Uh, these are these are pretty much uh, pretty strict anyway. So uh, so I think that uh, most districts you don't see where where they make any changes. Like Jessica said earlier, uh, if for some reason uh, not getting the paperwork, there's some fraud, something comes up like that, uh, the schools can disassociate with the booster club. If that does happen. Uh, Basically, you can't, uh, you can't use the school name in, in any of your activities, uh, nor can you use uh, any school facilities to do any of your activities. So that's, uh, that's the consequence if the school decides to disassociate with your group. You are required to carry uh, general liability insurance. Uh, proof of that insurance needs to be furnished to the school principal uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, there is no set minimum coverage as to what you need to have. Uh, the school board's insurance does not cover you, uh, so you do have to get a policy of your own. I always tell you, I don't know how much you need, but I think if I were looking at it, I would evaluate it based on risk, uh, depending on what you do. If you have a lot of students participating, where there's a lot of risk where somebody might get hurt, or you know, if you conduct your own tournaments and there's a chance that somebody might get hurt in that, then obviously you want to have a bigger policy than if you don't have those types of things. But in general, you are required to get, uh, get that proof of coverage. The principal should not be allowing uh, any boosters to fundraise within the district uh, or within their school without that proof of insurance coverage. All right. Local board uh, has to approve all school-wide fundraising activities. Uh, there is a fundraiser approval form in the red book uh, that I've referenced there. That's supposed to be completed before uh, you do any fundraiser activity. So Jessica says there's one in your folder uh, for your reference. The principal uh, can approve other fundraisers that are not school-wide. Just make sure you fill out that form and get that approved. So, does the district have any guidelines on like certain fundraisers, like gun bashes or anything like that? Gun bashes? Like raffle off a gun. <laughs> um. Is there we'll talk about Charles Gaines in a minute. Yeah. You cannot do this. I, uh, probably getting risky with guns, you know, in, in schools. Yeah, but that's, I mean, you just kind of have to use kind of common sense, um, you know, as far as what to raffle. This has to be assigned um, typically by your principal. So usually if it's something probably too gray, they'll probably not approve it. Um, but no, I mean, and then some, he's going to talk about that. But, um, but also it depends on a risk. Like we've had in the past, um, donkey basketball, um, where people, I think, ride donkeys and play basketball. Uh, and so, obviously, our insurance company found out about it, and they freaked out and called and said, you know, please, you know, this is something you can't do. So, you kind of have to look at it from um, a risk side, too, you know, because if somebody gets hurt, we're, you know, they're likely to sue us. Well, they're probably going to sue both of you. Uh, so, so you kind of have to look at it as kind of, you know. That's why you have that general. Raffle. Um, most people raffle like ATVs or, but you know, any of that's fine. But he's going to talk about raffles. All right. So once that fundraiser is approved, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that you're not allowed uh, to assign any fundraising proceeds to individual students. Um, they have to benefit the group collectively. Uh, you can't track anything by individual students. That's a violation of the IRS's uh, 
regulations, so just keep that in mind. If you are raising money, you can't allocate it uh, to the students that are, that are involved uh, or that are supported. It just has to benefit the whole group. In addition to that, uh, you can't require somebody to participate in a fundraiser. Uh, you can't require uh, money or something else to be donated in lieu of participating in a fundraiser. And like I said, uh, just by the nature of not allocating it to individuals, uh, if you don't participate, then you're still eligible to benefit uh, from the fundraiser. Now, students are allowed to handle funds. Uh, but obviously they're not going to have any responsibility, but they could work a concession stand or something like that or, or help uh, if you're selling something. They just can't, uh, can't be the ones responsible for anything. If you're doing something where you have stations, like a fall festival sometimes maybe, uh, they want you to sell tickets at a central uh, ticket booth and then have the people buy the tickets at that booth and then use them uh, around at the different stations. So. Pretty straightforward. Uh, they put in this. I'm not going to go through individually. It's pretty much common sense. The common sense is, you know, either you can buy things for the school, uh, you can donate money to the school and let them buy it. Uh, that's pretty uh, pretty straightforward procedure right there. There is a budget worksheet. I'm assuming that's in the folder. That worksheet is in your folder. It is also due uh, within the first 30 days of the school year or within 30 days of the first transaction. That budget should have estimated revenues, uh, basically by category, such as admissions, fundraisers, dues, uh, and then expenses by category as well. So that's what that, uh, that budget. And when we do, the, we do the audit of the schools, we always ask to see um, the budget, the Brewster Club, uh, EIN, where that's been turned in, proof of insurance, and then an annual report, uh, which is on this slide. That report for the prior year ending June 30 is due to the principal by July 15th of each year. Um, it should have on it what your cash beginning balance was, uh, cash ending balance, and then revenues and expenditures by category. And there's a sample. This is very, very, very generic, but um, obviously, if you're savvy in QuickBooks, you know, it, it would produce something, or, you know, if you're even savvier in Excel and want to make it look fancy, but for those that don't have time or don't, you know, get involved in those, this will suffice. Yeah, and basically, I should be able to take your beginning <laughs> cash, add your receipts, subtract your disbursements, and hopefully that's what your ending cash is. Uh, Otherwise, you know, there's a problem somewhere. So uh, just a quick math check on that. A reminder that uh, the money that you spend or the money that you donate to the school factors into the school's Title IX uh, reporting. So just wanted to let you know that, uh, that what, you, what you do if you're uh, raising money for athletics uh, does get uh, involved as far as the the reporting that the school and the record keeping it has to do for Title IX. So, all right, let's talk about charitable gaming a little bit. Uh, fundraisers uh, basically involve games of chance. Um, Kentucky has a Department of Charitable Gaming. Uh, they have a, a website that you can go to to get any uh, information, any more detailed information. Uh, their rules are part of the Kentucky uh, Revised Statutes and the Administrative Regulations. If you do uh, participate in charitable gaming and are regulated by the department, you have to have a separate checking account that is used only for charitable gaming purposes. Now, I know that that chart, hopefully you can see it in your slides, but I'll, I'll give you what, basically there are three levels of charitable gaming. The first is, you don't have, first level is you don't have to do anything. What you can do in that is you can have three or less, and these are all in a calendar year because they work off a calendar year. You can have three or less raffles, but they can only raise $150 each at a, at a maximum. So, you know, you're not going to have a raffle if you're only going to raise $150. So, so most people are going to fall in that second group. 
And the second group allows you to receive uh, up to 25000 uh, but you have to get an exemption, an exempt license from the Department of Charitable Gaming. Uh, in that situation, there are reports that they require to be filed, uh, and you would need to have that uh, bank account. If you're going to have more than 25000 then you have to get a charitable uh, license from them. Uh, so those are the three tiers of what you... If you want to do charitable gaming, what you're required to do. And that all goes through Charitable Gaming Commission. Um, we, as, as far as Hardin County um, schools, we don't issue that, we don't monitor that, but there is a lot of reporting and a lot of stipulations that they require um, in order to maintain your status. Yeah, their reports can get a little comprehensive. Uh, Especially if you get the full-on license, it, it's very complex. And if you miss, like if you're 10 days late, they will stack on some, I mean, they're worse than the IRS. They will stick on some pretty heavy fees. So if gaming license is something you're interested in, I would really make sure you have a committed treasurer or someone on your board that's going to keep up those reports or it's going to end up probably um, biting you in the butt in the end as far as not making any money if you're not submitting the proper reports. And they will, like, um, they will come down and, like, they monitor, like, they have auditors across the whole state that follow up with the people that have gaming licenses. They're, they're pretty serious about it. Yeah, especially if you have pull tabs or things like that. They check all, they check for sequential, make sure nobody's stealing them, and it's, uh, it's a pretty rigorous process. Uh, so that's, that's what you need. Uh, there's some items that are not considered charitable gaming. Um, just to give you an example of, of a few things that they have thrown out uh, already. So, If you do uh, conduct charitable gaming, make sure you're familiar with requirements like Jessica said. Uh, if a school itself has an exemption or a license, that's for the school only. So just like we talked about before with everything else, uh, you got to make sure that, that you get your own license. Or exemption. All right, the last thing I wanted to go through is just, just a couple of best practices to give you some ideas, uh, just things to think about. Um, someone separate from the individual writing the checks should receive the bank statements and review those statements before reconciliation. Um, so basically the, the bank statement, if you're still getting it by mail, uh, should not be mailed to the treasurer, should be mailed to somebody else uh, who doesn't write the checks. Uh, if you use online statements, uh, then just have that other person have the ability to log in and download that statement. If you're looking at that statement, some of the things you want to look for are missing checks, uh, any checks that are not uh, in sequence, um, any payees that don't make sense to you, that you aren't aware of, uh, any checks that appear altered, um, checks not signed by people who are authorized to sign them. Uh, I, don't, I can't tell you how many times over the years that we have seen where people wrote checks to, let's say it's supposed to be to Duke Sporting Goods, uh, is who they thought it was supposed to be going to but yet they were writing checks to a spouse. Uh, we had a football boosters a few years ago. We found about 15,000, and then they came back, I think, and the people gave them 10 or 12. So I figure they probably stole at least 20 uh, because, you know, they're never going never gonna to get it all back. But if somebody had looked at that bank statement, they were writing checks to, the treasurer was writing checks to her spouse, but nobody ever looked at the bank statement and you'd have caught it in 30 seconds. So please do that. It might save you some grief somewhere down the line. Uh, and also make sure to look at, if you ever have questions, ask to see the back, because I've seen in this district before, there's a lot of acronyms in schools and a lot of acronyms that we write checks to. Um, there's been some before that's been made out to an acronym, you know, and it probably wouldn't be caught, but if you look on the back, the treasurer was endorsing them on the back. So, you know, even if 
you're kind of like, well, you know, what is KMG? Well, KMG is Kentucky Mortgage Group, but that could be something that if you didn't know that, there's so many K's in education, and, you know, she was paying her mortgage. Um, you know, so, I mean, things like that, you know, so just kind of be wary. Again, if someone is, is got that mindset, you know, in that mind, then if someone's looking at the bank statement, they're less likely to go down that avenue. Is if they think someone else has their eyes, you know, monitoring things. But most most nonprofits don't, unless a lot of them do. Maybe if it's over five thousand or two thousand or whatever, but smaller checks they don't. The bank will run it through anyway, whether it's got one or two signatures usually. It's good to have treasurer, president, treasurer, and somebody else. That way two people have got their name on it. Yep. You can consider requiring two signatures. I've got it up there. Um, it's, it's basically more of a logistical issue for, for the clubs themselves. So it depends on how often you meet, how often you pay bills, those types of things. Um, and, and the two signatures probably don't need to be in the same household. <laughs> <laughs> Never, yeah. Never sign blank checks. Don't sign any blank checks uh, for use later. Um, get a credit card if that's, uh, you know, if that's an issue. If people say they got to have a check or something to go buy something. Uh, there's ways around that. As far as revenues, uh, you know, we talk, when we talk about the bank statement, you know, that's where we're talking about what was already in the bank. Uh, if it never makes it to the bank, then that's another concern. So just some, just some good points to think about. Uh, really ought to be deposited by somebody other than the treasurer because uh, they're the one who's doing the accounting for it. Um, you should have some sort of documentation uh, to ensure that all the revenues are deposited. You don't have to. Uh, we recommend you at least take a look. If you look at the Red Book, they have worksheets in there for inventory control, uh, ticket forms, fundraisers. They're in there, the schools have to use them, and they're in there for a reason. Uh, and they're very good forms to track the flow of what happens uh, to sort of ensure that, that the money is there uh, that's supposed to be there. You certainly don't have to use them, but uh, take a look at them. It might give you some ideas about what you want to do. If you want, uh, you can use purchase orders. Uh, you should always have an invoice. That needs to be uh, reviewed somebody bef other than the treasurer, you know, before those are paid. You don't want to make any disbursements without an invoice or receipt. Uh, if you're reimbursing somebody, make sure you get a receipt uh, to substantiate what you're paying for. Don't just write a check uh, for something like that. The board uh, of the group needs to review the revenues and disbursements. Um, if compare those to your budget. Uh, see if there's any problems. We always recommend that you consider getting fidelity bond coverage um, because you know if something does happen, somebody steals some money, unless they, you get them to pay you back, um, you're not going to get that money back. So uh, it's at least worth considering. We're talking to your insurance agent when you get the general liability uh, coverage. Uh, it can't hurt anything to to investigate it. So especially if you're in the big heavy groups, the bands, the footballs, the basketballs. Um, sometimes you can get into six figures um, on what you raise during the year. So a policy for a fidelity bond um, for me and I'm bonded well into the millions is like twenty five hundred dollars at Cornell and Hignite. So I mean I would say for Fifty to a hundred thousand. I mean, it, we're probably talking hundreds of dollars. So um, you know, it's very small. But you know, if someone took twenty thousand dollars or or you know whatever amount out of your booster club, it's going to hurt. And and chances are, um, you're probably never going to see that money again. Um, you can probably try to t you know press charges and stuff, but and garnish wages and things like that. But it's probably going to end up costing you more in the long run. So. It's not very expensive to obtain. So that's all I've got. Um, anybody have any questions or if you, you know, once we get done, if 
if you want to come up and ask me any questions, you're certainly welcome to do that. Uh, at the beginning of the PowerPoint uh, is my email address. Uh, so if you have something you want to run by me later, uh, certainly uh, feel free to send me an email. Does anybody have any questions for Brian? Um, one thing, on our website, let me go back. In case you get back and um, you're like, I heard them talk about forms or I lost my folder. And by the way, if you have other people that didn't get to attend that you know, you can grab some extra folders. Um, one year we had like 150 people. One year we had, you know, and this by far is our smallest. So we're all over the books as to how many people show up. So we never really know. So you feel free to take some folders. But on our website under um, departments and our departments, if you find finance and administration, um, you'll see red book and booster groups on the left. When you click on that, um, there's, there's a, an agreement, like the gentleman in the back talked about, when you want to start a booster group, um, this is probably what you need to fill out and sign and take to your principal. Um, it's kind of just like a contractual agreement as to what you're going to do and, and all of that. And it may be kind of slow coming up, so I'll go back over here. But also, um, Red Book for Booster Groups. Um, we've got the budget on here, the fundraiser approval, budget officer information. Um, this is one of the forms that you probably need to be turning in. Oh, hold on. Well, it's going to be, it's not liking my pop-ups on this computer for some reason. But anyway, you get the gist. Um, there it is. Um, there's the agreement for like the gentleman that wanted to initiate maybe a new booster group. Um, you would fill this out, sign it, turn it in. Um, again, the booster office information. Um, this is going to have the names of the officers, the federal ID number, um, all of that stuff that you need to be turning in with the budget. So those two forms um, are pretty imperative to probably be and turned in within the next, you know, little bit. Um, you know, since it's within the first 30 days of your first transaction, I'm sure, especially your fall sports. And I think everything anymore is a fall sport, pretty much. Um, or you start spending money anyway. Also, in your folder, um, there are some sample forms. And then Brian refers to the Red Book. We have, like, um, questions that were turned in to the Red Book committee from pe folks like you all that were um, booster group uh, members and said, what about this situation? What about that situation? Um, and, and they're called Frequently Asked Questions. We've put those in there. Um, we've put a list of everything Brian was talking about in kind of a condensed version if you don't want to have to, you know, go back to the entire PowerPoint. But in here it's General Guidelines. And then it'll say, basically, I've highlighted in yellow what you're responsible to turn into your school. So, and then like in red, I've kind of highlighted about the district employees can't be um, in check signing capabilities and, and that type thing. So that's kind of a condensed red book um, synopsis instead of having to go through and pull it all out of the red book. Again, you know, Brian, um, I'm at Central Office. My contact's on the website. Um, um, this is, like I said, you can find pretty much anything you'll need here. We've got Red Book forms in Excel on here. If you're like me and you do everything in Excel, um, the Red Book's on here. And then we've condensed it down to Red Book for booster groups, you know, specifically. This officer information, if you don't want to, it lays it out real nice and neat. It'll say all your officers, your EIN, all that, and you can just hand that, you know, to your school. And then the um, booster support organizational budget would go with that for now. Mm -hmm. I have a question. For a thing like an event, like a carnival or a festival or something, can we pre-sell tickets or wristbands before the event, or does it only have to be the day of? 
So her question was, can you pre-sell wristbands or tickets prior yeah. to the event? Yeah. Now, as far as record keeping. Tickets. We've always been told, do the double ticket so that there's one kept back, correct? Mm -hmm. And then for wristbands, keep like the first and the last. What's do we fine? need yeah. any record for okay. Yeah. I think. Then somebody should be reconciling to make sure that, you know, if we say we sold 100 of them for $5 dollars a piece, we got $500. Right. Okay. How far back do you keep records? I would say that you, all, you keep your determination letter and your 1023 forever. Um, I would say on the rest of it, as far as your, uh, at least seven years is what I would recommend. And when Brian was talking about being 501c3 status, which is what every booster group, unless you go through your school, and very few do, if you're not sure about that, there's a place on the IRS website um, where you can go out there and you can look. Um, I think, let me go back. Well, so if you have, if you have an ID number, and you think you're eligible to receive tax deductible donations, if you go to the IRS's website or if you just Google IRS Select Check Tool, you can type the ID number in there. Yeah. And if you come up, then you're good. If you don't come up, you know there's a problem. And it will also tell you if you're in like, if you haven't filed the proper forms, you might be in like a hold status or a warning status. I don't know what they call it exactly, but it'll say 990 not filed for two years, you don't want to let that revoke because it's probably close to $1,000 now. And if you pull on the front page of our website on the right, you'll see documentation in the application. The application's what, 70 pages? Yeah, it's it's massive. and not the EZ, it's massive. It's there yeah. And it's a lot of producing bylaws and just a big, massive amount of information. So it's imperative that you try whoever is in this organization to keep a folder with those things that Brian said you need, like your application and your determination letter, so that whoever takes over has copies of those. And a lot of times some of the problems you're running into is the IRS may have some officer on file who has been gone forever, you know, and then they won't talk to them because they got yeah. they kind of supposed to talk to who's on file. So, and that may have been the treasurer 10 years ago. So it may take a while <laughs> to, to ever get to the right people to get anything resolved. Because it's just like, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm helping somebody on a tax situation, I have to get a power of attorney that they sign and allow me to talk to the IRS. If you don't have a power of attorney on file, then they're probably not going to talk to you if you're not that person. Sometimes it just depends on who you get on a nonprofit, but. They never will on an individual or business situation. So here's the um, booster off officer information. You can print that directly off of our website, um, and it lists your your um, officers up here at the top. You can list your EIN, and then down here um, it talks about attaching a copy of your uh, insurance liability policy. So pretty much, it, we've tried to make it as simple as possible. You know, if you fill this sheet and the budget sheet, you're pretty good um, other than fundraiser worksheets throughout the year as far as turning stuff into the school until you get to the end of the year and you have to turn in your annual financial report. So. I do have one question. Mm -hmm. sure. So the treasurer should not be depositing funds into the bank. Should the treasurer be maintaining the funds? What do you mean by maintaining? Should be holding the petty cash throughout the year and, and signing over the portion that needs to be deposited? I think you could if it was petty cash because then you should have supporting documents to back up those transactions if you have to replenish the fund. I mean, we just recommend that if you're, you want to keep record keeping separate from custody of assets. So that's why we recommend that somebody else uh, count it, you know, count take it, it to the if bank. If you're doing a, you know, if you run a concession stand or something, if that's part of what you do, that the treasurer's not the one that sells it up at the end of the month. And I'm sure most of your banks have night drops. You know, don't ever take money home for your own, you know, risk. My, my sister 
her PTO raised like $20,000 one time and she called me, she's like, what am I doing? I was like, get it to a night drop. You know, do not take it home with you, you know, for the risk of, you know, something happening to it. You know, you don't want that risk on you. And it just don't, it's not good practice. So, um, even if it's a late, late football game and, you know, you've taken up a bunch of money, just, just take try to get it counted and, and organized and get it to a night drop. Mm -hmm. Can any officer fill out a W-9 form if you're doing a fundraiser and they require that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it just says signature. I mean, I'd say any officer can sign it. It's, it's really vague. But I just yeah. And again, make sure, you know, if you are sending out probably 1099s and if you're paying, you know, especially for, and I go back to band because they pay so many, you know, experts to come in like the color guard people and the field commander people and the drum people, you know, those people probably need a 1099 um, because I know a lot of them get paid, you know, thousands of dollars. If you pay, you pay more than $600, $600. Year, you're required to send a 1099. Uh, unless the business that you're doing with is a corporation. So especially when you're hiring. That's why you want to get your W-9 up front. Um, as soon as they come in, get the W-9 first. That way you got, you know, what kind of entity they are. You got ID number, social security number, whatever you need. So that way you're going to hear the requirement to file that 1099. And QuickBooks is really good. It, it mm -hmm. uh, so you're saying that a booster club could pay a private coach to come in but cannot pay the existing coach in? They could not pay a coach that would be part of the normal um, season. You could hire somebody to come in. They couldn't, they couldn't come to the games and participate in the games like a regular coach because all those positions have to be created by the board. You can hire somebody to come in, you know, as, let's say... Uh, what boost are you with? But, uh, okay, so say, say you, like a hitting coach or a pitching expert from, you know, Campbellsville, you want to bring a lady in, you know, who's, who's pitched for 20 years to work at summer camp. Yeah, you can do you that. You can do that. Okay. You just can't have someone, like, let's say it was a, the board doesn't pay for an assistant coach. Yeah. And you wanted one, you couldn't do that. Kind of like a special, like if you're football, maybe you bring in like a kicking coach or kicking expert, um, you know, something like that. Any other questions? Is there any limit on the amount of money a booster club can hold in their checking account? There's no limit. What the IRS mm -hmm. will tell you is they, they want you to have an excessive amount of funds. Um, because you're supposed to be using it for your exempt purpose. Uh, so, you know, you kind of use your own judgment, but normally, uh, you know, you don't see that as a problem too much of the time. Do the other way. <laughs> you probably wouldn't want to keep six figures rolling every year. Just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, somebody might be like, well, uh, you know, why are we out here washing cars on Saturdays? You know, just the perception of your members might be like, you've got us out here and it's 100 degrees, we're washing cars, and we got six figures in the bank. You know, what, what's the reasoning of that? So Now, but I mean, if you had an initiative, you know, say in three years you wanted to buy all new Damarini bats or Boomba bags and new softball uniforms and, you know, that's going to be $15,000, you know, then you could justify, you know, you could, going to the Macy's Day Parade. yeah, you're going to make North, North had a big thing for like three years. They, they had to try to raise $250,000. So, you know, if you've got something like that, new band uniforms, I mean, those are 50, 60,000. So, I mean, you could justify, I'm sure if the IRS had any questions, you know, we have a three-year plan or goal. Well, and you should all, like, if you're having board meetings, somebody needs to keep in the minutes of those meetings. Yeah. And hopefully you would have discussed that in those meetings. And you might even, I mean, you know, you might have it in a, maybe in a savings account or something even, just to kind of keep it separate. One other thing just popped in my head while I'm sitting here. 
In addition to those filing requirements, you have to file uh, every year with the Secretary of State and just update your information with them. You can just go to their website and do it, but it's due, I think, by June 15th or June 30th of every year. $15, I think. Uh, but if you don't do it, they'll administratively dissolve you, and then you got to go through the process of getting that fixed. So uh, just little things that you can avoid uh, headaches in the future. And we know, I mean, I was in sports in school, my mom, it, it flips and year to year, you know, you're handed probably a folder like this, here, I'm done with it, take it. So sometimes it takes a lot of investigative work on your part to figure out, well, who has this, who has this? You know, so I always encourage everybody, like Brian said, try to keep the copies of the main stuff from the IRS and all that in a folder and make sure when you hand it down, you know, you're handing down the stuff that the important stuff that everybody needs to keep. So who so, usually has that? Like, is it the treasurer? Is it the secretary? Is it the president? Who it would be whoever. To me, in my opinion, I would think the treasurer or president would be my two likely people. But it's probably whoever it got mailed to, and, and most likely, it, it, most of the time, it's probably the president that it got mailed to. And you know. I, Honestly, they may even be dead by now. You know, I mean, it could have been 25, 30 years ago, and they may not even live here. You know, who knows on some of these circumstances. Well, you <coughs> could call the IRS and give them your federal ID number. Yeah. And they'll tell you if you're, you know, if you're in good standing or not. But if you're not, then obviously you're going to be on notice. <laughs> uh, they're going to know that. So. They will probably tell you that. So, um, your office managers and bookkeepers, they're really good resources. They're trained on this as well in your, in your schools, principals, ADs. Um, so if you have anything come up, you can email me. You can, I can get it to Brian or you can email Brian. Um, or those people in your schools are generally who we kind of filter through. So, okay, well thank, thank you, you all for coming. Thank you.